Thanks everyone for joining us for our March webinar, um, Data Science on AWS. Um, we're in this little weird time right now where the US switched to the daylight savings time before um, parts of, of Europe switch over. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for, for making it here. Um, we do have a very exciting agenda today. Um, we're right on time. If you um, seen that a couple of days ago, um, PyTorch 2.0 got released. So announced last December, but um, we just got the release from Meta. And I'm super excited. We have Matthias with us today from Meta, and he will give us an overview of PyTorch 2.0. And then we talk about generative AI. We have Heiko here from AWS. Heiko will talk about how you can use prompt chaining for large language models. So super exciting um, to see the talk and the demos we have for today. And yeah, Chris, anything from your side for today? Uh, no, The I just feel free to ask questions. Um, we've seen uh, parts of this talk and it, it, it does generate lots and lots of questions. So uh, just post them in here and we'll try to get to them. Perfect. And with that, let me stop my share here and I'll hand it over to you, Matthias. Thanks for joining All us right. today. Thank you so much for having me. So let me first try to put up my screen before I start. Last time it took a bit. Is it working? Yes. Great. So yeah, let me know if I have to uh, turn off my video as well um, due to the connection. But if it works, it works. I will keep it on. All right. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Welcome to my talk. I'm Matthias um, from Meta. I'm part of the Applied AI team at Meta, uh, and I work with external and internal partners uh, on all topics PyTorch related. And uh, so yeah, today I wanted to give you a short uh, introduction to PyTorch uh, 2.0 and what it's all about. And um, before I go more into the like technical details of it, I would love to talk about um, like a quick overview and get everybody on the same page and um, what PyTorch 2.0 actually means. And so it's a breakthrough in many fields. And when the team started onto that journey of uh, PyTorch 2.0, the North Star was to deliver 30% out of the box uh, training speed up and make it uh, more easy to write um, backends, PyTorch backends for hardware vendors, as well as uh, scale PyTorch to even larger uh, distributed models. And um, large, uh, lastly, also to bring PyTorch back uh, to more to Python um, and make it more Pythonic and to invite people to hack on it and make, make it easier to, to contribute uh, for the community, basically. What we wanted to avoid is to create something that completely breaks uh, backwards compatibility. And so that everybody would have to rewrite the, the whole code to, to like um, get these benefits of, of speed up. So um, that's what we definitely wanted to avoid. And uh, so let's now talk about the, the motivation. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about the like what we do to speed things up in PyTorch 2.0, then I show you how, how you can just apply it. And later in the talk, I have a demo where I will go over like what's what's behind what's happening behind the scene basically and show you some insights there. This is something that you usually don't need to look at, but I think it's it's great to see. So yeah, why why do we do that? And um, it's basically because accelerators got faster over the, the years, right? GPUs just got way faster um, and we needed to uh, change our current software design um, to get to use that um, uh, that 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 not that new uh, these new compute capabilities that the GPUs brought in. And so it turns out that uh, we are pretty much overhead and bandwidth bound right now because in the for example in the previous GPU generation change we increased the compute power by about five uh, five x while we doubled the memory bandwidth only by by two x and so you just run into that uh, scenario scenario where your um, compute is much faster than you can talk basically to the GPU so and to to benefit from that increase in compute power uh, power we had to redesign the software. Um, without compromising on flexibility, um, that's, that's very important for us. So yeah, over the year, what we did or to, to keep up with uh, the performance of the GPU, we moved large 
portions of PyTorch into C++ to just reduce the framework overhead. But that also um, doesn't uh, close that, that um, gap between compute and, and benefits, basically. It just like gets rid of your, your framework overhead. So um, the challenge to, to solve that um, is basically, um, or how to solve that challenge is, is, is already known. Um, I, I wasn't around uh, at the time, but uh, Sumit claims that this slide is basically five years old, uh, which shows that the, it is not hard to under understand how to um, like overcome the challenge. The tough part is um, basically how to do that without um, compromising on flexibility of the user. So what you basically have to do is you have to compile. And so the challenge becomes then, um, how to compile PyTorch and allowing the flexibility, uh, still allowing the flexibility um, that the user just expects because there's an entire class of idea that just needs uh, a certain level of flexibility, like for example, dynamic shapes. And um, to preserve that flexibility uh, while you um, make uh, or you, you create a, a compiler for PyTorch, that's a, that's a real challenge. So yeah, let's see how a PyTorch or a, a general ML compiler actually works. So let's start with that, that basic function that's just um, um, comprised of, of three functions here. Um, and what the compiler does is first, it's a acquiring a graph. Then um, that means basically that it maps the function calls uh, here to um, a building block in a graph. And after that, you have to lower that graph into operations. And these operations um, of some of your blocks consist of multiple operations and some are just mapped down like the ReLU is, max, uh, is, is mapped to max uh, in, in this case here. And then you just need to compile that for your specific hardware. So for each of the operations, you have a, a operation that directly runs on the hardware um, that gives you your, your binary that you can run, for example, on a, on a GPU. And you do that usually um, having CUDA kernels, for example, in, uh, on, on the GPUs. So yeah, that's basically it. Uh, all all there's, there, there's uh, to do to, to compile. And the most challenging part is how to uh, capture that dynamic flow of PyTorch. That's the hardest challenge, basically, to, to let the user write whatever model they want and still um, acquire that, that graph. And, over the year, we tried uh, a couple of things. So we built uh, Torch um, did Trace, for example, Torch Script, uh, FX Tracing, Lazy Tensors, um, but none of them gave us everything we wanted. So some of them were flexible, some of them were fast, some of them were neither nor. So JitTrace, for example, has just a bad user experience. It's silently wrong um, because it just traces what you execute. And if you don't execute a branch, like for example, your branch here is an if statement, and when you go the, the first route, because your sum is bigger than zero, you never get to see the, the lower branch uh, when it's uh, lower than zero. And so even, even if you then have input that actually go, should go the lower branch, the, the program just executes the upper branch because that's, that's what's, what you traced. So that's, that's just a bad experience for users because I don't know it's, it's wrong. And then there is a Tor script and it, it was promising, um, but, the problem with it was that you had to substantially change your code and the code that it depended on. And that's just a non-starter for, for many PyTorch users. And um, for example, here, the uh, call to, to NumPy, um, it, uh, you would have to remove that um, uh, because it's not supported. Then in early uh, 2022, we started two more graph acquisition technologies. One was Lazy Tensor and one was Torch Dynamo. And while both of them uh, create similar outcomes, Lazy Tensor has a, a lot more framework overhead. And so all the focus went to Torch Dynamo in the end, which works out of the box on most of the models or on all of the models, but it just gives partial graphs. And what does it mean? Um, when you have an example like this here, where you basically um, have like uh, a branch in there, you have a call to, to NumPy, it just creates multiple blocks and some of these blocks can be compiled and others cannot be compiled. And then it gives you code that connects these blocks. 
And so what we then do is we go ahead and compile just the blocks that, that are compilable and leave the others as they are in Python. And that way you can capture any model you, you want and you still get that speed up because you can compile parts of it. So yeah, that's where Torch Dynamo sits. Torch Dynamo is basically the graph acquisition. But what about um, gradients? Like we just talked about the forward path here, like the, the foo method here would be our forward method in the PyTorch model. But we still also want to uh, accelerate the, the backwards path. So what we leverage there is because PyTorch 2.0 is uh, the, the primary focus is on acceleration training. And so it's critical that we not only um, capture user level code, but also capture the back, the back propagation. And the a AOT Autograd um, engine leverages um, the Torch dispatch um, extensibility mechanism to trace through our Autograd engine, allowing us to capture the backward path ahead of time. So you basically get both paths um, capture the forward method and the backward method, um, which allows us um, to accelerate both of these with, with, with Torch, Torch inductor, which we'll talk later um, uh, about as well. So these two components are the graph acquisition and they give you the acquired graph for the forward and backward path. So let's then um, look into the graph lowering, um, which is also a very important part here because this far it meant to implement over 2000 special PyTorch operation, uh, operators. And that is just like a, a very uh, draining endeavor for a hardware vendor or a small startup trying to create um, a backend for, for Py, uh, PyTorch. So within the PrimTorch uh, project, we worked on defining a smaller and stable operator set so that um, PyTorch operators um, or programs can consistently be lowered to, to these operator sets. And the goal was to create um, two sets. One is uh, the PrimOps, which is about 250 operators, fairly low level. And they are suited for compilers um, because they, they are low level enough so, uh, that you need to fuse them back together to actually then get good performance. And then there is the second set, which is the A10 ops, which is 750, about 750 operators and it's suited for export, uh, export as is. Um, because here you already have the, uh, the, the fusing um, in there and you don't need to recover the performance um, by, by uh, like compiling the, the graph again, um, like you have for the, for the prim offset. So these two operator sets uh, are like for like hardware vendors and, and usually you don't have to deal with these, but if you create a new operator, we are trying to um, put these, this new operator together based on the previously known operator. So we don't have to create another operator basically that, that hardware vendors have to implement, but they can just uh, have the fixed set implemented and that's it. All right, so the graph lowering is, is done with a new operator set, which makes it much easier to, to actually create such a, such a backend. So let's, let's compile then. And we do that with uh, Torch Inductor. Torch Inductor is our new um, PyTorch compiler. Uh, which is able to represent all of PyTorch. And it's um, built in a very general way, such that it's, it will be able to support uh, training um, and multiple backend targets. It's implemented in Python, which has a, its pros, pros and cons, uh, but it make, makes the system more hackable and approachable to users, which is, is great um, because we want that, that input from, from the users. And the approach to, to, to build uh, Torch inductor is breath first. So we sp didn't spend too much time on optimizing like uh, special op uh, like special operations or special kinds of operations, but to make sure that like the core infrastructure is, 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 is able um, to support the va vast majority of models of, of, of PyTorch. And um, so now that we have that, we will go and, 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 and optimize for, for more speedups. Um, but first we wanted to like have that breath first, first approach. And it's, um, so we have two backends. We have the C++ backend um, and the GPU uh, backend. So C++ is for, for the CPU version basically, and it leverages uh, GCC or LLVM. 
And uh, then the GPU part uh, for that we leverage uh, OpenAI's Triton to basically um, generate Triton kernels. And these uh, or OpenAI Triton supports um, B100s and A100s so far, um, and there's no support for older hardware. But on the other hand, on older hardware, you're not that um, like bandwidth or um, overhead bound. Um, so we don't expect there to be uh, like a lot of benefits on, on this, this kind of hardware. And, but there's also like work going on to support other kinds of hardware um, like AMDs, for example. All right, so let's, uh, let's that, that concludes my, my overview of the like architecture uh, of uh, PyTorch uh, 2.0. And now let's have a look into the API. Um, so we want to, to make um, the introduction of PyTorch 2.0 as smooth as possible. Um, for our users. And so the default behavior will still be the eager execution. And we, you can opt in into the compilation. And the only thing that you will need to do is that single line of code, torch compile your model. And then you basically get the compiled model that you then use for, for, your, um, for, 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 your, for, for your training. From there, you have different uh, modes for optimizations. For example, you can reduce the framework overhead by switching to reduce, over, uh, reduce overhead um, mode, which will um, use a bit more memories, memory and is uh, especially um, valuable for smaller models. And then we have max autotune where we produce a fastest model, but it takes a long, longer time to compile because we do all the auto-tuning and it's like some experimental heuristics in there as well. Um, but yeah, this, this would give you the most speed up, but it also takes the longest. Then we have the full graph mode, which is similar to numbers, no Python option. It compiles the entire program into a single graph. And if it cannot do that, it gives you an explanation why it can't do that. And most users are not like, will not need to use that mode. Um, but if you're very performance conscious, uh, you can try it out. And if you are going to mobile at some point or to an edge device, you will have to go the full graph route. Um, but um, for, for like trainings, um, it's, it's, it's optional. So it, that gives us like, uh, um, like a smooth transition between the eager execution, which is a default mode. So if you don't change anything, if you don't add torch compile, your model runs as before, like the default mode is still eager and to the compiled version where you can enable uh, full graph mode that would give you the most performance and you can, can squeeze out the, the, the last bit of performance, but you still have to probably alter your model similar in the way that you have had to do for Tor script, but no typing, for example, is required. It's um, not as restrictive. All right, um, so that was like the overview of the API. Let's now jump into uh, a demo that I prepared. We'll just switch to my other screen here. Hopefully I can. All right, I hope you see the, the notebook that I have prepared. And yes. that notebook, in that notebook, I want to go through two things. First, I want to show like just the speed up and how easy it is to integrate Torch Compile into a training. And then the second part, I want to look behind the scenes uh, of what's going on in PyTorch 2.0. And um, so for, for that, I'm um, going to enable some debug uh, features and then have a look at, for example, the Triton code. So let's, let's go first here and just run the first cell. We see that we are using uh, PyTorch 2.0, um, which was released last Wednesday. And uh, that's basically the stable uh, release now. And so we create a, a data set. Um, I think it's a sequence classification. Um, and I just wrote that from a pickle file. And then now we create a model. So this cell is just a basic, just creates a transformer model, uh, a BERT um, cased version. And we create an optimizer, moves that model to a device. Uh, in this case, it's an A100. So I also want to highlight here that we allow for um, like TensorFlow 32, which um, will enable the tensor cores and we will probably see more speed up um, compared to, to not using these because then we are even more compute bound, uh, sorry, uh, overhead bound, um, bandwidth bound. Um, okay, 
So all right, we, we have created the model and the optimizer, and then we have a simple training training loop here. We switch to training mode of the model, and then we just go one epoch through our data. Uh, nothing special. Just going to start that while I'm talking, and um, it's it's a standard loop. And just want to show you um, that like how much time we, we need to execute that. It's about uh, 27 seconds, I, I think. So, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete that model again um, and uh, empty the, the cache so that we have uh, memory left to basically uh, create our new model. So, okay, it was 22 seconds actually. All right, and now we are gonna create a second model uh, which is the same model, the bird case um, from Transformers. And then we are gonna uh, execute this line, which is torch compile. And that's the only thing that's changed. Like then we have the optimizer, we move the uh, model to a device. And here is basically nothing happening. It's just creating the model and we compile it, but we are not actually compiling it because it's a just-in-time com compi just compiling. So as soon as you execute, your model, you will actually do the compila compilation. So let's now compile that. And oh, I'm going up and down here a bit. Let me try to not use the mouse. All right. So this takes a bit longer because we are actually compiling it in the background now. And that will take some time. Um, but for this model, I think it's under 30 seconds. And if you're doing a training over several hours, this couple of seconds will or should not matter too too much. So, but let's um, so it compiled it. Let's let's interrupt that that running kernel now and rerun it so that we have now the compiled model in cache and we can directly use it. And we already see here that we had before an iteration per seconds of one dot nine. And now we are at uh, 2.3, just by changing one line of code, basically. And the overall runtime is now 17 seconds. So we saved uh, per, per epoch here five seconds uh, on a scale of, of 20 seconds, 22 seconds, which I think is pretty good for one line of code. And this is the, like just the speed up for one of the models. Like um, this is about like 25%, but on every, oh, the geo, geo mean uh, speed up is, is 30%. And for some models, it's, it's even more. Like we, we get up to, I think, 2x um, uh, speed improvements um, for some models. So, all right, let's um, now look a bit into what's going on behind the curtain. And so for that, we are gonna define a function because what you can do is you can not only compile models, but you can also compile functions. And so we have here like a torch thinners and torch cosinus calls plus some like addition and multiplications. And to look behind the curtain, we have to enable some, some debug flags here, which I'm just gonna run. Uh, so it's basically, we enable the debugging for Torch Dynamo and Torch Inductor, because that's what we are using here as a backend. And then we compile foo, which is our function from above, and we run it to actually use a compilation. And what we see here in the, in the debug output is already like the tracing of, of the model. And when we look closer into that, we see that we load an attribute of torch, which is the Sinos, and then we call that function and store it in A. And that's all that there was in, in this function here. We had who with um, calling the Sinos and saving it in A. And all of that is showing up in, in our trace. And if we look into the folder of that script now, this is a default folder, torch, compile, debug. When we enable these debug flags, we get for once is the debug log, which is also showing here. And then we have AOT torch inductor uh, debug log, which we can open. And this is one form of, 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 of an X, FX graph, uh, which is then uh, passed on, uh, to torch inductor. So we have here the, the Sinus, we see here, here our original code, and then we have the multiplication and, and addition. And, this is the FX um, code that we compile then with Torch Inductor and Torch Inductor is creating um, Triton kernels out of this. So, and the difference between what PyTorch 1.0 was and 2.0 was is basically that we have these code generated Triton kernels, which 
put all the instructions into one kernel and then just execute them from the uh, beginning to the end. And that gives us a speed up because we don't have to go back to the Py uh, Python pro uh, pro um, program at all. So let's look at, at one of these uh, Triton kernels here, running a bit um, out of time. So I'm just gonna rush through these, uh, this kernel here. Uh, what we basically see is some like creation of, of support um, uh, constructs, and then we load data and apply the sinus and the cosinus on it. And then we do the multiplication and addition in the end. And this kernel is what, what, what Triton looks like. Like this is Triton, it's, it's very similar, or it is basically Python. It's a special word, um, like dialect of, of Python. And this, this gets compiled using the Triton um, compiler and then runs on, on the um, GPU. And this is a Python file that would actually run um, and you could, could execute this. And that's created from Torch Inductor. And okay, let's go a bit further and look at a second example where we actually have a graph break in here. So we have an if statement and then we execute a, a double sinus and a double cosinus. And we compile that in the same way. And we again, get this trace here and let's just look at the Triton code again. And we see here, hopefully this time it works. Yeah, we have multiple Triton kernels. So we, for each of these blocks, basically, the, the first block um, where we in the end get the sum and the comparison between uh, like zero and that sum, we have that in the first kernel. And then we have the second kernel down here, which is like the double sinus. And then we have the third kernel here, which is the double cosinus. And this is basically three blocks. This is the first block. We couldn't compile the if statement. So it was broken up into uh, uh, three graphs here. And then we have these two uh, Triton kernels or these blocks that are then uh, created uh, for what um, Torch Inductor will create two more kernels for it. All right, um, that's it for, for that demo, maybe I can quickly show, okay, this will, when we enable full graph mode, we will get a graph break, which looks like this, it's just an error message. And then we can also let us show, um, let Torch Dynamo show us and explain us what, what happened. So if we execute this Torch underscore Dynamo explain on that compiled uh, uh, model, we get the explanation that we had an if statement in line three of our cell. And that's ba basically breaking the graph. And if you wanna use full graph mode, we have to change that line um, to not use the if statement. All right, that concludes my demo here. I'm just gonna go back to my presentation and quickly finish that. Um, so uh, I can share the slides. This is just like an overview, overview of what you can enable uh, as, a, as debug flags. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details here because I'm out of time, wanna be uh, uh, considerate to, to Heike here and his, his talk. And um, just one more thing, maybe if something goes wrong with uh, PyTorch 2.0, we uh, have several tools for you to basically debug that and create issues. And first of all, it's, it's necessary to find the, the point where it breaks, basically. We have multiple uh, elements in the stack. So we have Torch Dynamo, IoT Autograd, and Torch Inductor. And you can switch the, the backend out to use, for example, uh, just eager and circumvent the AOT Autograd engine to make sure that, uh, or to, to see where your, your error actually occurs. If it's in AOT Autograd or lower, or if it's uh, uh, already in, in eager where, where, the, where, where things break. And then there is uh, also the accuracy that, that might um, be different between eager and your compiled model. And we, we have a tool for, for all of these circumstances, which is called the minifier. And first you need to figure out basically where your error is occurring in eager, AT auto uh, grad eager, um, or the torch inductor level or the accuracy. And then you can enable several reproduction levels to um, find that place and extract it from your graph or from your program. And it creates a minimum example um, using basically uh, divide and conquer. It cuts your graph, runs the, that subgraph and sees if, if sees if the error is still there. 
and then cuts it further to minimize that example for you. You don't have to do that. And that gives a great minimal example to post as an issue to the GitHub repository. And you like you have several levels to do that. And we have a great guide, uh, like a troubleshooting guide where all of that is explained as well. And um, that just wanna like underline here that the minifier replaces weights as well as data with random data. So you, if you post that minified example, none of the uh, like um, uh, your, your like data or weights are actually posted because it's all random, random data that just uh, um, gets uh, used in these random examples and in, in these minified examples. Um, all right, okay, that, that con concludes my talk here. Um, this is just like a, a few pointers to more information on PyTorch 2.0. We have a great Q&A session with our engineers um, that you can read through our website, PyTorch.org, get started on PyTorch 2.0, as well as some blog posts and the documentation, the troubleshooting guide here in the bottom that I, that I um, uh, mentioned before. And Dynamic Shape didn't make it into the release this time, um, but it is now in a stable uh, state or in a good state in the nightly. So if you wanna like try that out, you can do that in the nightly branch now. Um, all right, yeah, thank you for, thanks for your attention and uh, happy to answer questions if there are any. Thanks so much, Matthias. Um, great overview of what's coming or what's what's available right now. Um, couple questions here, um, rough timeline for AMD support. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the timeline. Um, I have to, Okay. <laughs> Just say, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> um, people were asking, yes, we'll post the recording. Um, other question, the demo notebook you showed, is that somewhere available on a GitHub repo? I can make that available, yeah. Yeah, or if you we'll have a link maybe to, yeah, to other tutorials as well that walk through how to get started maybe with PyTorch 2.0. Mm -hmm. We'll include that. It can probably also include the slides and the Perfect. links in there. Yeah. Yeah, I saw a question here also, PyTorch 2.0 support for the AWS deep learning containers. Um, the team is actively working on it right now with the GA release. So yeah, check uh, back in, in just a few weeks and I think we will have an update there too. <laughs> um, we have a bunch of more questions um, in the interest of time. Um, maybe Matthias, if you can take them in the chat window. We have questions sure, yeah. more about dynamic computation graphs. Um, maybe just um, in terms of performance, to give people kind of a you know a comparison, what's what's achievable. Um, I saw that on uh, actually the FAQs for 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 the release as well that on the example of the hugging face transformers, right? Um, hugging face said they they were observing um, between one point five and two times um, speed ups in training hugging face transformer models, just to give people kind of a, a sense of yeah um, what's possible right right yeah it's a geo mean the 30 percent is a geo mean of over all the models that we tested which is quite like a, a large arsenal of, of models and um for some it's more for some it's less um but we are like working to optimize that further and it's still there, there are still definitely some some uh, parts that we can can work on and optimize yeah all right great yeah if you can jump on the other questions in the chat and, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll stop sharing and <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thanks so much, Matthias. Appreciate it. And with that, I'll hand it over to Heiko. And we're switching topics to large language models, and we're going to learn something about prompt chaining. I heard, right? Thanks, Antje. Yes, indeed. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, that's the wrong screen, I think. Uh, yeah, we see um, the desktop. Yeah. All right, how's that? Looks better. Blog post coming. Excellent. Cool. So um, today I want to give a, a quick overview on a, a technique that allows you to basically supercharge large language models. So if you've been paying any attention in the past, I guess, three, four months since ChatGPT came out, large language models are, you know, 
the the latest greatest thing although they've been around for for quite a while now but um what we see with chat gpt and other large language models is they obviously have a knowledge cutoff and that means if you ask it some question around current affairs which um you know one of those questions could be who's the current prime minister of the uk and because we change prime ministers here almost every month um it will get that answer wrong uh, it will say something as uh, to along the lines of like as my you know knowledge cut off date of september 2021 current prime minister is uh, was boris johnson but you know please note that uh, that's might have changed now uh, we want to actually overcome um this um this limitation um and what you can do in order to overcome this limitation is you can um, use a technique called prompt chaining. And in, you know, if I were to summarize prompt chaining in one sentence, it's basically giving the large language model access to external information in order to uh, answer questions factually correctly. So, you know, if we contrast ChatGPT versus um, a large language model that has been supercharged with um, Langchain, which is an open source library for prompt chaining. We can actually ask it the same exact question who is the current prime minister of the UK and ask you know, uh, a few more additional questions and it will come back with the, with the correct answer. Now, if you wanted to set this up, I wrote this blog post, which is available uh, for free on Medium. Uh, it's called supercharging large language models with Langchain, and it goes into the setup. So basically, um, it shows you everything how to get it get started with Langchain, and there's a notebook attached to it as well um, with some code, and it shows exactly how to um, how to get started. However, um, I thought it was fascinating when I first tried this out. And I was uh, interested in uh, what's actually happening under the hood. So today, my objective is to take you a little bit on a journey on like what is actually happening. How is this working, this lang chain under the hood? And uh, in my blog post, I have this, this diagram that you can see here. And it basically gives a very high level overview of what's happening. So we have a, a query from the user, who's the prime minister of the UK, Langjane will um, uh, provide an agent that um, basically uh, takes that query and formats it in a way that is, um, uh, gives some instructions to the large language model. And then Langjane provides access to something like the internet or a database, answer comes back, and the agent gives then response back to the user. However, that is a high level overview. So I wanted to actually understand what's happening in this yellow box. And because Langchain is an open source library, we can, uh, we can actually explore that. So um, now this, um, just one second. The Zoom uh, control bar is in my way and I cannot go to my next tab. Kind of annoying. Um, how can I uh, catch and disable uh, hide video panel? No, I don't make it control. So sorry about that. Um, so if we take a closer look on what is actually happening in uh, this yellow box here, uh, it's, it's the following thing. So a user has a query, and then the Langchain agent actually creates a prompt that gives specific instructions to the large language model. And we're going to see uh, what those instructions are in just a second. But then the large language model basically because of these instructions, as the option to get back to the agent, to the Langchain agent and say, well, for this particular query, I actually need to access some information from the internet. So the large language model uh, you will see later will actually come back and say, 
I need to query the internet uh, in order to answer this question. So the agent then takes that information from the large language model and queries the internet via an API. And the search query will also be produced by the large language model. So the search query in this case would be something like UK prime minister. Uh, who is UK prime minister? The Langchain agent then performs this search and then um, comes back with the information and then updates the prompt for the large language model. So now in the prompt, we're gonna have the instructions as well as the original query, but also the result from the internet search. And basically it goes back to the LLM and says like, well, look, here's what I found, you know, querying the internet about the, uh, the prime minister of the UK. Can you now actually answer the, the query from the user? And if the large language model then gets back and says, yes, now I have all the information in order to answer the query of the user, then the final response will be, will be sent back to the user. And this cycle can, uh, can happen actually quite a few times, which we will also see uh, once we get into uh, the code. Because uh, remember in our query, um, we gave a few uh, questions to the large language model. We asked it not only who's the current prime minister of the UK, but we also asked where was he or she born and how far is their birthplace from London? So it's gonna take a few iterations until the large language model has gathered all that information via access to the internet and then comes back uh, finally with the result. All right, so with that, I want to actually switch over to my coding environment. Um, let me pull up PyCharm here. So this is a script, and again, this is available in the GitHub repo that is related to the blog post that I shared earlier. Um, and basically what we're gonna be doing here is we define a large language model. Uh, for our case, we just use the, um, I think the default one from OpenAI is GPT 3.5 at the moment, that might have changed. Uh, we're gonna define a API for a internet search um, using the Google Serpa API. We're also gonna give the model access to a um, Wolfram Alpha via an API and also to an SQL database. Um, the SQL database is gonna be relevant for the second query that you can run uh, by yourself. We probably won't have time to dive into that second query in this script um, during this session, but you can run it yourself um, at home. Um, and then we're gonna define all these tools and basically initialize the Langchain agent. Uh, we give it access to these tools, to the large language model, and then um, we're gonna start the query and run the Langchain agent on it. So, so let's see what actually happens um, under the hood here. So I'm gonna now debug, and I have a few breakpoints in my program and also in the Langchain library so that we're gonna be able to exactly see what's happening. So now whenever you see the screen line here, um, it means the program has stopped at this particular point in time. So this is just before we're gonna run the agent. So let's go one step further. <clears throat> and um, this, we are now at a point where we are just before calling the large language model. And um, we are already in the land chain library. And uh, what we can see here is actually the prompt that has been generated by the agent. So remember, <clears throat> we have here um, a query, but then the Langchain agent creates a prompt out of it. So let's have a look at what this prompt looks like. Um, if I just go on here and then go on view, and I hope this is large enough, but I'm actually gonna copy that in a second as well. So you can uh, uh, read it completely, but basically, you know, we, we, we give it all these um, specific instructions. Uh, we basically can tell the uh, large language model something like answer the following questions as best as you can. And you also have access to all these tools and then use the following format. And we even tell it, you know, 
that this uh, chain of thought or this prompt chaining can actually happen several times. And then, you know, once you know the final answer, give the final answer back to the original question. And then we see here the query from the actual user uh, being uh, inserted here. Um, so this is all the prompt that has been generated by Langchain just from our uh, original user query. And now I want to show you actually what happens uh, when, when, we, um, when we call the large language model with this prompt. And uh, because it's a little bit not so, um, uh, to, it's not so clear when we run through the code what is actually happening, I think it becomes even more clear if we actually go to the OpenAI playground. So I'm gonna copy this prompt. <clears throat> Going to go to the OpenAI playground. Going to paste in here the whole prompt. Um, one thing to note is there is a stop word uh, that we're going to be using. It's called observation because we want the large language model to only go up to this point. We want to understand what kind of action it takes and or action it wants to take and what the action input is. Um, so I can enter observation as a stop sequence. So basically telling the large language model whenever you reach to a point where you would want to write the word observation, just stop. So um, temperature, I think we set to zero. Um, and that's it. So let's see what is actually happening. So here we go. So basically, we told the um, large language model, um, you know, tell me, you know, your your thoughts. Like, how would you go about solving or answering this query? And it comes back and says basically, well, first of all, I need to find out who the prime minister is. Um, where then I need to find out where they were born, and then finally, how far away is their birthplace from London? And then it tells us. Well, you gave me access to all these tools, right? Search, Wolfram, and FUBA. And it seems like in this particular uh, case, because I first need to find out who the prime minister is of the UK, well, I, I think I need to do a search. Um, and the input for the search should be who is the prime minister of the UK. Okay, so now the large language, <clears throat> sorry, now the LLM came back to us with this kind of information saying like, I would love to do a search uh, and the search input should be used the prime minister of the UK. Now, how do we actually give access? Um, how do we give GPD access to the internet? Now that is again, handled by the Langchain um, library. So if we go back to the code, we're now gonna uh, generate the same response that we actually saw in the playground. <clears throat> um, so if I go one step further, um, it now um, goes into the uh, OpenAI API and then comes back. And basically what you will see here in the full output is uh, exactly what we um, uh, described uh, or what we saw in the playground as well. For some reason, I can't really zoom in here, but um, I assure you, it also says here, I need to find out who the prime minister is, whether we're born and so on and so on. Action is search, action input is who's the prime minister of the UK. Now Langchain will take that and be like, okay, all right, then uh, let me do actually the internet, uh, like, you know, query the internet for you because, you know, Langchain is just a uh, Python program with, uh, you know, we can just use uh, Python commands to access the API that we have defined. So we can just run this search. And this is exactly um, the line of code where the um, where we're going to uh, request the search from the SERPA API. Uh, you can see here the question we're going to be asking is who's the prime minister of the UK. And once it gets back with the answer, 
um, what you're going to see is if you go to Google, actually, <clears throat> and type in who is the prime minister of the UK, uh, it gets back with a so-called answer box. So uh, you've probably seen this uh, for a while now. Google actually does not even give you a relevant article like the Wikipedia article. It just gives you straight out the answer in a so-called answer box. Um, and that's exactly what's happening here with this SERPA API, with the Google API as well. Um, you're going to see, you know, um, like it asks, uh, was there an actual answer box? And if so, just take the uh, results from that answer box. So if I step through here, it's going to say, yeah, there was an answer box. And uh, the answer box told me Rishi Sunak is um, the answer. So um, let's go back to our diagram. <clears throat> so we are now here in this bottom right half um, where we have queried the internet about who is the prime minister of the UK. Um, the agent now will create a new prompt, very similar to the old one. It's going to say instructions, exactly the same instructions that we saw earlier. It's going to have the query, but then it's going to also have the search result. So let's have a look at that. <clears throat> All right, we are now again in the code at the point where we're gonna call the large language model. And uh, let's have a look at the prompt again. I'm just gonna copy the whole prompt and we're gonna have a look at it in the playground. So back in the playground, I'm just gonna delete everything here. And I'm going to paste in the new prompt. So this is the new prompt. Um, and you can see it's exactly the same instructions. Uh, here's the query. <clears throat> um, but we also gave it the observation from the action. So we are telling now the uh, large language model, look, um, I did the search for you. This is what came out of it. Uh, what do you think now? So uh, let's, uh, let's ask it what it thinks. Uh, hopefully it's not giving up on me. Hmm. Let me refresh my browser, paste in the prompt again, temperature to zero, Stop sequence observation. All right, let's run this again. Maybe I have to increase the max length. Don't know. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So um, basically, the large language model says, "Okay, that's great. Thanks for you know looking up um, who the prime minister of the UK is, but I still cannot." answer the full query of the user. I actually now need to find out where Rishi Sunak was born. So it comes back again. I need to do an internet search and I need to find out where was Rishi Sunak born. Um, so this cycle is going to repeat now um, again. Let's have a, let's speed through it in uh, uh, the interest of time. <clears throat> And it looks like uh, even with the API call, um, it's going to take a bit longer than usual. <clears throat> Don't know if this. Hmm. Right. Anyway, um, basically, it comes back and tells us, you know, you need to do a, a, an input again, um, a, a search again for me. Um, there we go. Um, and then do the same exact thing, run the tool. In this case, the tool is again an internet search, extract the answer for me, and um, do all over again. So this is the last time uh, we're going to run this. Just going to copy the whole prompt here again.
And um, now the observation from the internet search is Southampton, United Kingdom. So let's run this one more time. Uh, and now this time it tells me, okay, because you gave me this tool, Wolfram, which is useful when you need to answer questions about mass science and geography, uh, this time I want to find out how far Southampton is from London, and I want you to use the Wolfram Alpha tool uh, in, in order to find that out. And the action input is, again, uh, a search query, but this time we're going to use the Wolfram Alpha uh, search. Um, and it's going to do that as well until it by finally gets back with the um, answer. <clears throat> Um, let's just run uh, all the things through. Let me see. Yeah, so I can zoom in here now. So basically in the end, it will find out, okay, now I have all the information that I need. So now I can give uh, this response here. And um, that's how you basically supercharge large language models. You can do that with any kind of uh, information store. It could be the internet, it could be Wolfram Alpha, could be your own database. Uh, again, if you go through the um, the code, um, I set up a, a small SQL SQLite uh, database here um, that demonstrates how this is done with a, a SQL database. Um, you can hook up a Elasticsearch document store and basically give the large language model access to all those information. Right, um, and with that, I'm bang on time. Um, if people want to uh, ask any questions, I'm here for a little bit longer. I don't know if we can stay on this call a little bit longer, but uh, happy to answer any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks so much, Heiko. Fantastic demo. I think, yeah, people are enjoying this demo. Um, I collected a few questions here from the chat. How do mm -hmm. we know that the query result that is coming back, let's say from the internet, right, is actually the right answer? Yeah, so um, basically you have to, when um, <clears throat> you have to write this uh, pass results function very cleverly, it's, 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 the, it's the answer, right? Uh, we, we, we don't know. Um, and, and, you know, this is not a, a perfect uh, tool, um, but if you find out, you know, sometimes that it doesn't work, um, go debug into your code and see if you can make it uh, work in a way that works with uh, your particular use case as well. But uh, yeah, uh, in the end, you, you don't know. Um, you can be, you can try to be as clever as possible with um, you know um, the these APIs um, in order to try to cover all the bases. But sometimes it will break. Mm. Yeah. Question, Langchain is supervised, correct? Langchain is supervised. I'm not so exactly sure. Did in, in the sense of, did the LLM answer the user query? So how, maybe you can just, how L Langchain is used here. Mm. Uh, let reiterate. me go back yeah. to um, this image here. Basically, Langchain is, it's not a model. Uh, don't confuse it with the actual model. It's basically an application put on top of the large language model, and it does all this handling for you. It creates the actual prompt that we used in the playground. It gives that prompt to the large language model. The large language model comes back with something like, I need to search the internet. It uh, understands that. It then, Langchain also does the querying of the internet um, and creates a new prompt and goes through that cycle. It basically handles the, the administration all around the large language model in, answer to, in, in order to answer the, the user query. All right. Oh, um, yeah, and we saw keywords you use, like the action, the observation, et cetera. How are mm. those keywords learned? Is it like hard coded? Is it just, you use that and then you specify it here? And the stuff- Yeah, so- what you need to understand is um, GPT 3.5, which we used here, Text DaVinci 003 is 3.5. Also GPT 4 and other large language models have been instruction fine-tuned. And what that means is if you give these large language models like very specific instructions, like the ones here, 
um, they will be able to follow these because they have been fine-tuned to follow exactly these kind of instructions. So you can put here like any instructions that you really want. It's not like these are specific keywords that have been ingrained to the model. It just learns them by you giving it in the prompt. It's, it's fascinating how these large language models can understand your intent that you give in your prompt, um, but that's all there is to it. All right, and then I think we had one more question here. What else can LangChain extract from the internet in case there is no response box from Google? And I think yeah, you touched on that in, in a couple of areas, yeah, but maybe some. Yeah, areas. so so if because LangChain is again an open source library, uh, you can you know just clone it and and use it um, and expand on it as as you see fit. So for example. If you see there is no uh, meaningful result back from the internet, maybe you want to try out uh, a different search engine, or you want to try out Wolfram Alpha instead, or you, you want to build in some logic that says, if there's no meaningful response from the internet, then try my internal wiki or something like that. You can build all of that um, within LangChain. Cool. Um, what are the best resources to learn more about LangChain besides your um, blog post? That... <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, um, you know, I have to obviously give a shout out to the uh, creator of LangChain, which is definitely on me. It's uh, um, a fellow called Harrison Chase, and he has been putting a lot of work into this library um, in the last three months. I think he releases new versions daily almost. Um, I use version 0096, we're now at 117. Um, go through his um, documentation, it's uh, fascinating. Um, you can add memory to it. So that means uh, right now our agent would forget that we asked about Rishi Sunak, but uh, just like ChatGPT remembers your previous conversation, you can add memory to your large language model as well uh, with LangChain so that it will remember that I asked about Rishi Sunak. Um, so this is basically the best place to learn more about it. Great, and I think there's one last question. What was the effect of the stop sequence? What would have happened if we missed it? Uh, yeah, we can just try that out. Let's um, take that away um, and run it again. It basically will just keep going and that will throw LangChain probably off. Um, so basically, yeah. So it then, you know, comes up with like, you know, the, the typical hallucination effect then kicks in because it feels the urge to keep going. It's like, well, I got to make something up. Um, so basically we wanted to stop uh, right there in order to, instead of giving this hallucinated facts, uh, we want to actually give it accurate information. All right, perfect. Yeah, and if people want to read up um, more the details, the prompts you used, um, how to build this, um, definitely check out Heiko's blog post. Um, Heiko, I think it's a wrap. Thanks so much um, for, for delivering the session. I'm super excited to, to see those tools um, coming up and, and what you can do and, and how you develop the large language models further and, and improve them. A um, couple of um, wrap up comments here. Thanks everyone for joining today. Um, the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel and also make sure to join next month meetup if you're interested. Um, we're gonna have a demo about Amazon Data Zone um, that helps you to share search and discover data across um, within the organization. And Chris, I think you're gonna do a demo next month too on end-to-end -end generative AI pipelines, including reinforcement learning. Right? Yeah, that's right. It's a really, really cool demo uh, with a bunch of, of moving parts, but um, in my opinion, it's uh, as close to the papers that have been presented on um, the RLHF reinforcement learning with human feedback and instruction and and all the fun things that we've been talking about over the last few months with chat gpt and similar so yeah definitely right. tune in next month and i also want to share a quick plug um if you live in the bay area in the us um there's the hands-on workshop coming up next week i think chris your team organizes that 
um, that touches on how to implement MLOps. So if folks in the Bay Area are interested, I just put the uh, link here in the chat too. Cool. Yeah, I would normally be there, but I actually uh, cannot make it this time. So uh, hopefully next time. But yep. Thanks, right. everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And thanks to our speakers today. Have a good day. Thanks for having okay. us. Thanks. Bye.